Welcome back to World War II TV and the final show in our current Operation uh, Husky series. I can promise you we will return to the subject. We may look at some individual actions as part of generic kind of combat weeks, or we might study particular units, but we will not um, leave this as being the only content we do about Sicily because it's proved to be very popular. Anyway, our guest today, Stephen Clay, will talk about the US 1st Division in Sicily and how the terrain affected the campaign and what can be learned visiting and studying the uh, the area on military staff rides. If you are new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe. Consider that you may want to become a patron or channel member, and all the information you need is in the description below. But without further ado, I'm going to bring Steve in. Good afternoon, Steve. How are you today? I'm doing uh, better than I deserve. Yeah, yeah, and you've, you've better had your, your bionic replacement bits and pieces since we did our chat. So, um, the Sicily, it, it, you know, we, we will talk about staff rides in a minute, and we will talk about the benefit of doing of, of visiting battlefields generally because that's what you do and, and have been doing for a long time. But Sicily, I we, we, one of the recurring themes is it's sort of under the radar a bit in terms of learning things. People think of Normandy first, perhaps they think of you know the Battle of the Bulge. Would would you agree that Sicily kind of has fallen through the cracks a little bit? Uh, yes, I would. I mean, it's just one of those campaigns that people just don't pay as much attention to as they as they can and probably should because every battle or campaign has their own uh, insights to be drawn no definitely and it's got it's got a bit of everything it, some things went very well from our point of view think some things didn't go very well it's like a sort of a, a, a mini a, not mini for those who fought there but a case study of perhaps some some larger campaigns and 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 more more important and more discussed campaigns that follow but anyway you've come to arm with the powerpoint uh, that i'll be char in charge of today so we're going to go through close staff rides and then the actual terrain in sicily itself so folks Fire away with questions if you have them, but I'm fairly certain in terms of terrain and what the first division are doing, Steve will cover it. But basically, I'm going to hand over to my guest to take us to the, uh, how terrain affected the campaign of the Big Red Wine in Sicily. Okay, well, uh, first off, I'd like to do a, a couple of things here real quick. Uh, uh, give you a little bit of my background and why I'm presenting this uh, uh, presentation the way I'm doing it. Um, I spent uh, 27 years in the U.S. Army uh, as, an, as an infantry officer, and I've been working at a place called the Combat Studies Institute since 1997, first on active duty and then after I retired from the Army. Uh, while I was on active duty, I was the executive officer of the Institute. I was also the staff right team chief for a period of time. In fact, I actually wore both those hats for a while. And then my last uh, duty assignment there for about a year was as the uh, chief of the research and publications team. And then I, I retired uh, from the Army in 2006 and uh, basically took off the uniform, put on civilian clothes and continued on as what was essentially as the research and publications team chief, where we wrote a series of books, six each, on uh, U.S. Army operations in Iraq and, uh, and also six on uh, the Army operations in Afghanistan. And then uh, about uh, uh, 2016, that task was done and I got rolled back over onto the uh, staff ride team is the staff ride support team, which is uh, basically I'm the, I'm the team lead uh, of, the, of the civilian instructors that are contractors uh, that support uh, the team. And basically, we do the same thing as the as the what are called the Army professional civilians who are employed by the U.S. government, and I'm employed by a separate contractor. Um, last point I'd make is that if you notice a little bit of bias in the way I'm presenting this, it's because. Uh, uh, I'm the president of the 16th Infantry Regiment Association. I'm also the regimental historian. Uh, so uh, if I talk a little bit more about the 16th uh, than I do about the 18th or the 26th and the first ID, that's uh, uh, part of the reason why. But frankly, we, we admire your honesty, Steve. We've had people on here who've been, who've been SAS and firmly love the SAS, rather people from other units who are firmly uh, supporters of the unit they were part of. And and why the hell not? Eh? You're wearing a big yeah. red one cap. Um, best to be best to be honest about these things. We can't wait to hear your insight. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that that kind of makes that, uh, that give you my background, so you know where I'm coming from. And because I was on the staff ride team, I want to talk a little bit about staff rides before and how terrain fits in with that. You know, what is a staff ride? I think a lot of people have heard that term. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people think of a staff ride as a battlefield tour. And it's not really. It's it's related, uh, but it, it differs quite a bit because typically when you take people out on a staff ride, uh, of correction, on a battlefield tour, 
I would take them to some place like Little Round Top at Gettysburg. And I'd point off in the distance and I'd say, okay, there's Warfield Ridge. Uh, there's the Peach Orchard. There's uh, Rose Woods. This is Plum Run Valley. That's the Devil's Den. And, you know, Longstreet met his attack, you know, through the, the Peach Orchard and explained all that what happened. And you get done with the fight in the Plum Run Valley. And you say, okay, what are your questions? And then usually you get questions like, uh, well, where was the 27th Indiana in this fight? You know, because they usually have a great grandfather, somebody who fought for the 27th Indiana. And he answered questions like that. But there's no expectation that there's going to be any real discussion. They're there to learn what happened. And that's not what a staff ride's all about. Um, a staff ride uh, should be conducted, in our view, kind of like a graduate level professional development seminar. Uh, the purpose is not to teach the history, and the purpose is to provide soldiers with professional development in leadership, command, and planning, and especially for them to draw insights, lessons learned, if you want to call it that, um, in what we call the timeless uh, aspects of the military art. So uh, much of, well, the important part, well, let me get to the important part. Uh, let, me, let me go through the three phases of a staff ride, and as you can see them up on the screen there, the first one's called preliminary study. What we do is we send to the participants, and it's typically, typically going to be a you know, regular Army, National Guard, Army Reserve unit. Um, it can be ROTC units. Uh, we've even done uh, staff rides for non-military units. Um, you know, not much call from the Air Force, the Navy, for obvious reasons, because terrain really isn't involved. <laughs> Uh, and that is nearly as much as it is for the Army. But, for example, we did a staff ride for the U.S. Forest Service, and it was all about firefighting, okay? Because when you fight a fire, you have front lines, you have, uh, you know, all, all kinds of similarities between, uh, you know, a combat and a, and a firefight. So um, uh, you kind of get the, the idea. But generally, military personnel, we send them a read-ahead. And the read-ahead basically gives them an overview of the battle or campaign. And uh, the idea is that when they come to the battlefield or the campaign area, they should already know at least what the major muscle movements were of what happened. Uh, so they're, they're, they're familiar with it. Now, if they have the time, uh, what we also like for them to do, and that's, you know, for active duty units, it's a, it's a challenge uh, uh, really for any of them. But uh, uh, surprisingly, a lot of them try to do this where we assign role players. So again, going back to my Gettysburg example, we'll assign somebody, or actually they'll do the assignment, uh, but they assign somebody as Meade, they assign somebody as Longstreet, Lee, uh, A.P. Hill, you know, Dan Sickles, whoever. And then they go do a character study of this person with an emphasis on uh, a little bit on their, their early war background. And then OK, you know, what, what's their personality like? How are they getting along with their senior commanders, their subordinate commanders, their peers? What were what was their plans? Um, you know, what were their thoughts? What were their plans What their, their brothers? Did they have did they think the Meade's plan was a good one? Uh, those types of things so that they understand what those commanders were, were dealing with in terms of decisions and so forth. And so uh, when we get to a, a particular point of the battlefield, uh, we we start off, or when we get to the battlefield, we start off with what's called the field study. And we call that ODA, Orientation, Description, and Analysis. So when we get to that first stand, which, by the way, that's a British term. Uh, uh, we stole it from you. Uh, uh, you know, most people, it's like a battlefield tour stop. But we call it a stand. It's nice and neat and uh, makes sense. So you stand there and you orient the the players to the terrain. Okay, so they understand where Warfield Ridge is, where Little Round Top is, where Rosewoods are, and so forth. They can they can read it, they can see it, uh, and typically we have maps with us helping to visualize all that sort of thing. Uh, and then we go into the description. Now, the description with the battlefield tour is I describe what happens in the fight uh, at a staff ride. You turn to General Meade and you say, "Okay, General Meade, what was your plan for defense?" And General Meade, whoever that person is, gets up and describes what, what, you know, what his plan is. Now, if you aren't playing role players, you can still ask those questions because people should know enough that they can answer a lot of those types of questions. OK, and then you go to, OK, you know, General uh, Longstreet, you know, you're going to make this attack uh, uh, to Little Round Top. What are your, you know, what are your plans? How did you want to see this uh, pan out? 
So you go through that whole process where the players actually describe the fight. And uh, the at the end of the description, uh, and of course, the terrain is going to come out as part of that. And I'm going to give you a, a good example of how that does come out during these the, the, uh, the description. Uh, if there's anything that they've missed that are key points, then you bring those points out to the players so that they re recognize, oh, yeah, yeah, we got it. We can't forget about that because it may have an impact on the next stand or somewhere later on the, on the battlefield. Now, I want to uh, give you a real uh, quick uh, uh, discussion about how the terrain comes into play. And this is a, a, one of our best examples um, a, a, on a staff ride. At, uh, for those of the folks out there that, that have been to Gettysburg and have been to the Peach Orchard and uh, particularly a place called the Pennsylvania Monument, you might have a pretty good appreciation for what I'm about to describe. But we start off at a place called the Pennsylvania Monument. And you look off in the distance and you can see the peach orchard where General Sickles moved his third corps away from the Army of the Potomac line along Cemetery Ridge and pushed it out in front of the rest of the army. Now, there's this is an ongoing controversy in American history. People think Sickles was a fool. Other people uh, think that, well, maybe he has a point here. And uh, most people have a, you know, an opinion one way or the other, but I'd say the majority of them probably think before they go to Gettysburg that Sickles was a fool. So you're standing out there and you're looking at, at, at the uh, peach orchard from the Pennsylvania Monument and you see it out there and you see that uh, the peach orchard has a slight rise. It's almost, uh, it's not indiscernible. It's enough, but it's not anything major. It's not huge. You know, you're talking maybe a 20 foot rise in, in elevation so forth. But when you start heading um, south along the road, we walk them down that road toward Little Round Top. And as you're walking down that road, what you discover is that the peach orchard starts to disappear because you're actually losing elevation the farther you go. And the rest of his core, third core, was down that line. By the time you get just south of Little Round Top, all you see in front of you is another rise that's maybe. 10 feet in elevation, but it's all of maybe 200 yards in front of you, which means if you're defending in that area, the Confederate forces can get within 200 yards of you. And not only that, but it's, it's wooded. So they're, as they're coming through, and it's summertime, as they're coming through the woods, you're not even getting good shots, you know, you know, at, at a packed mass of men. And so Sickle saw that and he said, this is undefendable. We, you know, we, we have to push out to meet them, you know, forward, which is what he does. And you'd be surprised how many number of people, once they see the terrain and those subtle changes in the terrain, they realize, holy moly, you know, yeah. I, this starts to make more sense to me now. So that's where the terrain comes in to be very important and to understand it and analyze it. Uh, so when we get to the third step, which is analysis, that's where the real learning is, okay? We've, we've, we've we laid out the ground. Most people can figure out their orientation. People hear the description, yeah, they know 90% of that. You get to the analysis, the questions then become, okay, so what? What did you draw from this, uh, this experience here that will hold you in good stead as a military professional? What's the, what's the insight that you've gained from this? And it may be planning, it may be leadership, it may be you know, you know, uh, analysis of terrain, it may be any number of different things. But the whole idea is get them to think about uh, what all this means so that in the future, when they find themselves in a combat situation, they've been exposed to many of these problems before. Okay. Um, well, I'm guessing, Steve, that analysis of the terrain is as important in 2023 as it was in 1863. You know, I mean, yes, there are some some better bits of tech to help out now with you know, surface, surface imagery and Google and things like that. But actually as an officer or NC non-com standing and assessing a battlefield and which would be the gully that would give more protection, which is the ridge we should move through that though, all those skills are exactly the same now as they've always have been, I'm assuming. Absolutely. I ask any tanker, you know, how is important to ter terrain to his approach to the enemy objective? Okay. Uh, I, I'll give you a better example because we, we tend to always talk about, you know, what the infantry does, what the armor does, what the artillery does and artillery, you know, impact has a great deal of, uh, I mean, uh, the, the terrain has a great deal of impact on 
or artillery in flight, especially if you're trying to hit targets on the far side of the mountain or far side of a hill. Yeah. That becomes very problematic. Uh, but let's just talk about a medical guy. All right. You've got soldiers that are going to be going up, breaking away from the main road in Sicily up to the left and the right uh, because you can't just march down the road. You've got, you, you can't leave the high ground to the enemy. And so they get up on the high ground when, the, when those roads start getting tight and wind, 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 you know, winding and so forth. And you have a firefight up there. Okay, how are you going to get that guy who's just been wounded back to the clearing station? Right. And from there, how are you going to get him back to the uh, field hospital if you're on a one lane road? Yeah, you have an ambulance, but how are you going to get him there? Mm. And so you, you have to analyze the terrain and look at things like alternate routes and so forth. So my point is the terrain impacts everything soldiers do, regardless of whatever branch you serve in. OK, OK. We always put so much emphasis on it. In a, and I'm an infantry guy. Right. But. But, you know, like I say, all these other branches, logistics guys and so forth, have to look at the train, analyze it, look at that, uh, you know, OK, what's what's plan B if plan A isn't going to work uh, and, and those types of things. How are you going to get the ammunition and food forward if, if, if it's all blocked with tanks? So you, you've got to kind of think all those things through and you got to do reconnaissance and all the rest of it that like an infantry guy needs to do. And I think a lot of people miss out on, uh, on thinking about those things sometimes. So that's the field study. And then when we get done, we usually uh, take about a day off if possible. And sometimes we can't do that. We come back together the following day and then we go through the integration session, which is take what you've learned in the preliminary study, integrate it with the field study. And then we typically ask them, you know, two questions consistently. And then other questions fall out of that. But the two questions basically are kind of what I, I talked about before. Okay. Now that you've seen, you know, you've studied Sicily, you know, what are some of the, 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 the big picture lessons you draw from this? You know, is either as a commander, as a planner, as a medical guy, whatever, you know, however you want to approach it. Um, you know, what, are, what again, what are some of those things that you've drawn from this that you think are, 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 are important? Because a lot of times looking at a map and reading what happens is a whole lot different than looking at the terrain and discussing what happens. Okay. Uh, and then the second question uh, that we typically ask is about the terrain itself. You've seen it all now. You, you, you know, it's one thing to look at the map. How has the terrain changed your perspective about what happened here? Or once again, how you would operate in an environment like this. So that's what the whole integration session is all about. And as you can see, that's where the learning really is, is, is intended to be for soldiers who go on a staff ride. So I wanted to share that with your audience. So next time they hear staff ride, don't think battlefield tour. Okay. Well, you see, I always meet staff rides and normally when they're at the pub. So, so, <laughs> so sometimes yeah. my understanding of what they're doing is sort of they're here to just have a few beers. But no, I, 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 I'm, I'm being, I'm being cheeky there. But yeah, I, well, no, you're not because unfortunately, a lot of times active duty unit. Well, I say units. That's kind of what they're out to do. But uh, uh, regardless of what their intent is, if they have the staff ride team out there, they're going to be forced to learn and answer questions whether they like it or not. So, yeah. Anyway, okay. Well, now let's talk a little bit about, about so, you know, some of your uh, earlier guests may have covered this sort of stuff. If not, okay. Hopefully I'll tie it in with uh, with them uh, pretty well if, uh, if they have. But, you know, the, the whole bottom line comes down to or why are we going to Sicily in the first place? Okay, so I want to throw this map up here, show the Mediterranean, and you can see very quickly, uh, you know, how important Sic Sicily is to the whole Mediterranean area. Okay, and the Allied planners, as you know, where we were still in North Africa, they started uh, coming up with, okay, what do we do next? Where do we go? You know, how, and what are our objectives? And those objectives were, let's take Italy out of the war. We got to figure out how we're going to do that. Uh, we also, because remember, when we land in North Africa, it's November 42, what's, that, what's going on or else around the world? We've got Russia, Stalingrad specifically. And so we want to see if we can help uh, the Russians by drawing away German forces from the Eastern Front. And then the last uh, thing that they, the major objective is, how do we open up the seaborne lines of communications through the Mediterranean, which uh, the British Navy has basically written off for the time being, because as you can see, you've got Sicily and Sardinia and Italy and other, you know, Greece, 
where the German and the Italian Air Forces are able are able to basically affect very good control over who is able to move ships through that area. And so um, the what they settled on was there's a number of things they could do, and I won't get into those, but the, the gist of it is, okay, we're going to go to Sicily because we think Sicily gives us the best opportunity to, uh, to, to meet those objectives. Now, uh, as you're probably well aware, Sicily is a you know, historic stepping stone, if you will, for various and sundry invasions in the past. You know, the Romans used it, the Carthaginians, the Moors, and so forth. But with the advent of air power, Sicily and places like Sardinia take on a whole new importance because of the ability to reach out and touch somebody a long distance away. Um, and in fact, as uh, Mussolini starts rebuilding his navy, he decides, I don't really need aircraft carriers because I've got airfields on Messina and Italy and Sardinia, and those things can help me achieve Italy's, you know, uh, uh, security objectives uh, just as well, maybe even better than aircraft carriers because you can't sink Sicily. Okay, so... Um, that's where this is uh, where it all come, comes down to is, OK, we get to, to Sicily. Uh, it gives us a stepping stone to, to get into Italy, but also takes out a lot of airfields that the, the Italians and Germans are using so that the British Navy can uh, can start uh, operating more effectively in, in, in the American Navy, too. But particularly the British Navy uh, operating effectively in the Mediterranean Sea. OK, uh, let's go ahead and move on to uh, the next slide. There you go. And I want to talk and give kind of a general description of Sicily. And as you mentioned, uh, most of my focus is going to be on the 1st Infantry Division in Sicily and, and, the, and the route that they take up uh, all the way to a place called Truina. But what I'm about to describe really is pretty much, um, no matter where you go in Sicily, you're going to run into these same uh, dynamics when it comes to the terrain. So if, even if you're talking about the British Eighth, British Eighth Army coming up from the southeast corner, uh, a lot of what I'm describing is the very same challenges that they had as well. It's kind of like a funnel, isn't it? It doesn't matter where you start. You're going to end up yeah. having to come out at the, at the point at the mouth of the funnel, which is going to be Messina, because yeah. you're going to get to Italy. So, I mean, we did it with James Holland last week. Sorry to interrupt you. But, you know, the, the planning went through nine iterations of do we land the left or the right, the south, the west. We had big one, all in one place. There was no perfect solution. It was the, the eventual plan, like all of them have been, was a compromise between sort of spreading out. And it, you, know, you look at certain amphibious landings in World War II, it's, ob it's only obviously one place to go. And they went that obvious place. Sicily, yeah. there's no obvious obvious place all right yeah because i mean you look at the map there you, you see all the, the the light green around the edge obviously the north is not where you want to go it's too the two the high ground's too close to the beaches and so forth but you could land it in fact they do make some amphibious landings on they're very small but um uh, of course as you can see you know to the to the west there the vicinity of marsala uh, that first big arrow uh, nice big open plain uh and then the, the next one you can you can follow that beach line all the way down to Jela, and you see the Jela plain there between Lakata and Scaglidi. By the way, I'm I'm no expert in pronouncing some of these Sicilian names, so I might get them wrong. But um, anyway, that was the next next realistic option they could go to, the south uh, uh, eastern corner, uh, and then finally the Catania plain, which is maybe arguably the best location to land. Uh, Apart from that, travel some Mount Etna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, ultimately, of course, as uh, we'll discuss here in a moment, that those two most southern uh, landing areas is where they're going to go in at. Now, uh, uh, another uh, aspect of the terrain was, of course, the mountains. Uh, Italy is very mountainous, as you can see. Not huge mountains, but they're 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 challenging enough. And uh, landing in the southeastern corner, there's really two kind of mountain ranges, if you will, that they have to contend with. Uh, that's the one that you see running. Uh, northwest uh, out of the uh, the vicinity of Syracuse there, uh, and then north until you get to the the larger mountains, which I've run across two different names for these mountains, the Nebrodi Mountains, uh, and um, I'm trying to remember what the other one, oh, the, the Caroni Mountains, and you see them interchangeable there apparently, or, you know, whatever you, you know, whatever you choose is good enough, um, and, and those uh, ran, as you can see, generally close to the northern shore, those are the, the highest mountains, and they average, you know, 4,500, 5,400 feet. 
uh, with a couple of peaks that are, you know, a few peaks that are higher than that. Uh, the one, most obvious ones that you see there. And of course, uh, Mount Etna, uh, somewhere close to 11,000 feet, which is, I guess, technically a, a uh, uh, you know, a, a volcano for all intents and purposes. Um, so you had those those mountain ranges that you had to contend with. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the roads as well. The roads along the coastline generally tend to be pretty good. They're largely uh, uh, paved, you know, particularly the major thoroughfares within the towns and the cities, they tend to be paved uh, and they're pretty well maintained. And so mobility along the coastlines generally isn't a problem. Um, however, when you start going inland, the roads start to get less and less uh, well-maintained. Okay. As you get up into the foothills and you have some paved roads up in those foothills, and that's kind of that light yellow uh, uh, area that you see there. Uh, you'll have a few paved roads up there, but again, most of the roads up in those areas are going to be either gravel uh, and some of them just dirt roads. Um, and even so, they those tend to be somewhat uh, well-maintained as well, a little wider avenues, uh, you know, two-way uh, traffic, not unusual on those roads. However, when you get up into uh, beyond the foothills, you start getting into the mountains is where you start getting into the single lane roads. Uh, a lot of them are dirt roads. Some of them, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, some of them are, are, are gravel roads. Um, and because of the relatively dry terrain or the dry environment, it's not too difficult. I mean, you don't have a lot of problems with mud and everything unless you have a torrential downpour and you're on a mud road, then it may be a problem. Um, but the other thing is you're into all these switchback roads uh, where you're, you know, turning back and forth and climbing and, you know, steep climbs and, and so forth. And uh, obviously those types of roads in terms of getting supplies forward, ammunition forward, uh, meta uh, back to the rear are, are tend to be a little more problematic, uh, as you might imagine. Now, the towns themselves, cities and towns, again, cities, I've mentioned them, they're, they're pretty well maintained. You don't have a problem getting around and so forth. Uh, but the large majority of the towns and cities in Sicily were built on high ground. And so, and, and for the purposes, and they're built in the medieval period, most of them, and, and they were built for the purposes of defense. And so as a result, when you are approaching one of these towns, you find that the, the roads themselves are, you know, again, switchbacks, you know, they're, 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 they're in, in a lot of that because you have to follow the terrain and so forth. But uh, uh, the other thing is that when you get into these towns, especially the smaller ones, they're very narrow streets. And so if you're talking about getting tank forces through there, uh, you're going to have some difficulties in some cases. And I'll talk about those more. I'm going to show you some illustrations here uh, where there's some real challenges with that. Um, the population itself is largely within the cities and towns, unlike the U.S. and you know places like you know Dorset County and uh, other places farther north in England and so forth, where you have a lot of people living out in the countryside on farms and so forth. You don't find that nearly as much in Sicily. You know, farms and ranches they tend to live; those guys tend to live in the towns, not entirely, but mostly. Uh, and so you don't find a whole lot of single home residences out there in the countryside. So it's relatively, uh, uh, you know, clear of population. The the last thing I would mention is forests. Now, you're probably familiar. Many of your your listeners are familiar with places like the Hurtgen Forest, you know, dense forest, you know, just tough to get through and definitely not tank country. You're not going to find that in Sicily. You know, very, very few uh, dense forest is certainly not much in, in the area that we're talking about here. And when you see trees, generally they're single trees. Sometimes they're lining the main thoroughfares. Uh, sometimes they're, they're orchards or they're near, like, like I say, one of these relatively uncommon uh, uh, farm places that have trees planted out there. But generally trees are not a, a mobility problem for anybody moving in Sicily. There's other mobility problems uh, that they have to deal with, as I've already mentioned. Okay, so that kind of gives you a general, general description of, uh, of the challenges of the terrain in Sicily. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, again, 
the, the, the decisions, uh, as we mentioned, on, okay, where do we go, ultimately come down to the British Eighth Army coming in uh, on the southeastern corner of Sicily, just south of Syracuse there that you can see. And then the uh, U.S. Seventh Army are, are going to land uh, between Lakata and Scogliti uh, in the uh, Jela Plain. And you can see the three major players there uh, for the Second Corps that land. You got uh, th uh, Third ID, the First Infantry Division, which is the main effort, and then of course the 45th Infantry Division, which is uh, actually a Green Division. It's a Oklahoma National Guard Division, but it's going to do a very credible job here in. Uh, in, in Sicily, does a, a, a good job. Anyway, so that's uh, what 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 the ultimate decision is, how we're going to land. And as I mentioned just uh, 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 a couple times now, I'm going to be focusing on the 1st Infantry Division and their movement north and finally over to Trowina. All right, next slide, please. All right, uh, before I do that, I want to share with you a little bit about the 1st Infantry Division uh, because, you know, like I said, I'm a little bit prejudiced to get a bias, uh, but also because I want to share something about the division that I think is missing in a lot of World War II U.S. divisions. And for all I know, maybe the same today, I don't know. But, uh, you know, because the terrain in North Africa is so similar to Sicily, the, 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 the experiences in North Africa were good preparation for the 1st Infantry, Infantry Division going into Sicily. And they did a couple of things to get ready uh, for the operations in Sicily. First of all, they went to the Fifth Army Amphibious Training Center. And why that's important is because if you think back to the landings of the 1st Division at Arzu, uh, and really most U.S. Uh, landings in, in Oran and other places, the majority of the, the uh, infantry forces coming ashore were landed in Higgins boats which is not an LCVP. I mean, Higgins made LCVPs, but and it's a similar looking boat, but the big difference is there's no front ramp. Okay, so you had to pile over the sides. You had to get the boat ashore, and then you had to pile over the sides to get onto the beach and so forth. So by this time, the, uh, the Navy has uh, brought in these LCVPs uh, that we're going to be using at, uh, at Sicily. And so there had to be training conducted on those. We also had a number of other new type of landing craft, most, not uh, most notably the, uh, uh, the landing uh, craft infantry, LCIs, which are a, a much larger landing craft. They usually will come in after the, the initial assault forces and the LCVPs. And they, they, instead of holding, you know, 34, 35 guys, they hold like 200 guys. And they beach and they drop ramps on either side of the bow and everybody runs down those those ramps onto the beach and off you go. So you can get, you know, a, a company ashore within literally minutes uh, uh, with one vessel as opposed to, you know, numerous LCVPs clogging the beaches and so forth. Um, opening up space for the LSTs, for example, coming into the land tanks and artillery and whatever else. Um, okay, so another aspect of, of the division's efforts, and this is where the first division, as I say, gets a little bit different. And by the way, I'd, I'd like to show this book to you, if I may, may, for just a moment. It's called No Sacrifice to Great, First Infantry Division in World War II. It's written guy, by a guy named Greg Fontenot, who's written a number of other books. Um, you know, the most recent part of this one was one called The Redemption of St. Vith if you're familiar with that. But Greg uh, did something a little different with his, his, this book. And what he does, he starts out pre-World War II and talking about how the 1st Infantry Division trains. And this is where I'm going. How it prepared for World War II, what it does after uh, North Africa to integrate all those lessons learned uh, into their training. And then the same thing after Sicily, what they did to prepare for D-Day and on and on and on. They, they go through this whole process every time. And he, he does a great job explaining all that. And one of the things that, that he talks about is how the division integrates both those soldiers who'd been wounded and left the battle early and those soldiers who are uh, new replacements to replace guys that aren't coming back. And uh, in the first division, it was always emphasized that you bring those guys in and make them part of the team. 
Now, most people who studied it realize that a lot of U.S. divisions, when a new guy came into the unit, um, they didn't do a very good job in integrating the, the, the new replacements, primarily because they didn't want to get to know them. Because the fear was, hey, he's a good guy. Three days later, he's dead and they're feeling bad. And so a lot of times they kind of kept him at arm's length. Well, that wasn't the rule, generally speaking. I'm sure it happened here and there in the first division, but there was an emphasis on not doing exactly that. So the division was noted for uh, uh, something we call the integration of FNGs. Uh, NGs stands for new guys. I'll let you figure out what the F stands for. So. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the other thing I would point out to you is something that in the staff ride team we call the Chickamauga rule. And the Chickamauga rule, uh, it refers to the Chickamauga campaign and the two days of fighting at the Battle of Chickamauga. And one of the, 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 the problems that you, you, you tumble to very quickly there is how both the Union Army and the Confederate Army, as they cross attached brigades and units and so forth, the commanders of those divisions would take that brigade cross attached from this division and they'd give them all the bad jobs. OK, you're going to make this attack. Okay, you're going to do this 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 dangerous mission, blah blah, you know, blah blah blah. Well, you can imagine what kind of impact that has on morale. And so, in the first division, it, it kind of it, on a bigger scale, other than just bringing in the new guys. When you bring in a unit and it's across attached to you, uh, you bring it in as if one of your own. You you feed it like you feed your own unit. You make sure they get fed up front. Uh, you make sure they get you know, resupplied and ammunition, food. Uh, they and they you build trust and confidence with them so that they're reliable in combat. Okay, uh, so again, another thing that I think Greg does a good job at uh, at explaining uh, the first division. Okay, so there we are. We're getting the first division ready to go, and uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. Oops, there we go. First thing I want to talk about is, is the biggest terrain obstacle, of course, is the Mediterranean Ocean. And uh, again, the you know the night of the movement as they're moving out of the ports uh, out of uh, Tunisia, uh, the Mediterranean, like it does so often, is just one big massive storm. And this uh, turns out to be kind of a, a hidden blessing for the Allied forces, primarily because uh, the Canadian uh, correction. The Italian High Command, the Coastal Command, uh, felt that, well, you know, the Allies, they're not going to storm through all this. To, you know. So they went on a reduced alert uh, posture. Uh, and as a result of that, when they finally start making the landings uh, the following morning about 0200, the coastal troops are not fully deployed. In fact, they're not even halfway deployed, which makes the whole landing much less difficult, as you kind of ma kind of imagine. There's there's uh, relatively, uh, at least in the first division area, uh, relatively little resistance, and the, uh, the the troops were able to get to shore fairly in fairly good order, uh, without a whole lot of casualties. Uh, now I'm going to go through a description of the 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 terrain here in Jela area, and then I'm going to show you where these are, and then what kind of what they look like, so that you have a, a visual understanding of uh, uh, of the terrain. First off, are what are called runnels. And most people run into this term uh, at places like Omaha Beach. Yeah. Uh, and what it is, it's a, it's a riverbed-like terrain uh, that's caused by the cross currents of the ocean. And what it does is it cuts a deep trough, uh, leaving what is essentially a sandbar forward of the beach. And in many cases, it's, it's, it's two or three of these sandbars that have been cut and in, in separated from the beach. And uh, what this does is, is it causes problems with the actual landing. Although, yeah, let me let, let me just leave it there, and I'll explain uh, where where the, where the land uh, where the difficulties come to play. On the beach itself, in Jela, uh, as you might imagine, you're going to run in that you know the, the troops are going to run into tank ditches and barbed wire and the fixed defensive positions. But as I mentioned, because of the relaxed defense posture, getting through things like the tank ditches and the barbed wire was much, which a much, a much easier process than it would have been, say, like at Omaha Beach. Uh, the other key thing, though, about the terrain itself is the sand. Uh, the Jayla beaches are, they're not really that wide, but they're extremely soft. And so when you start bringing vehicles ashore, they tend to bog down. 
And I'll talk about that. It's a mobility problem. I'll talk about that more in a little bit as well. And then beyond the beaches, you get out into what's called the open plain. Uh, and I'll show you images of that as well. The, the, the challenge for that is if you're going ashore and you're an infantry division, what you're doing is you're charging headlong into open tank country. Okay. And lo and behold, who's facing the first division? You've got a, a, an Italian armor group and you get the Herman Gorn Panzer Division facing the 1st Infantry Division in what is essentially really pretty tank country. And then finally, as you get up off the plane, you get into the, you start getting into the foothills, which I'll again talk about more here in a little bit. Okay, next slide. Now I've got a now, couple of questions for you, just but the, the, the hopefully won't yeah. be too too much of rabbit holes, but they're they're both worth worth asking, I think. So so Manny yeah. Lopez is saying, how do you think that the regimental combat teams impacted US tactics? Do you think that the attachment of a huge number of different tank destroyer artillery and other units had a positive impact? Now we could go on a massive break talk about the, what re regimental combat teams are and how they differ, but is there is there kind of a quickish answer to that you can give? Yeah, I, I, I would I would point out uh, two, two comments on that. First of all, very briefly, regimental combat teams is one of those terms that you see thrown around a lot in World War II. Technically, they're a separate organization from a division. They're a separate yeah. regiment. They aren't assigned to a division. A combat team is a divisional, essentially, regimental combat team. They're, the, the organization is very similar, uh, although not necessarily identical. So when you use that term, I would just uh, you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, the second thing is that um, as far as the attachments, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on when you're talking about. I mean, uh, getting ashore with all the attachments and so forth, particularly in a situation like we face here in Jaila, uh, you know, if you read through, you find that a lot of those attachments don't get ashore until after the fight's over, you know, uh, and, and, and a lot of the stuff that they would have normally had forward to help them. Uh, then I'll address your. Well, that, well, that was the thing that came up with Mark Zelke and others is that that by Husky, the Allies have not reached the peak they were to to reach later in the war. Where they ha they don't have an abundance of everything later on, but they've got enough. In Sicily, you're 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 paying Peter to pay off Paul. You know, if you're putting more tanks in 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 landing craft, you've got less in engineers, or you're putting more engineers, you've got less. Whatever you're, it's a trade off, isn't it? So, so, so the organization of any landing is based on a if we put more of that, we'll have to expect, accept the fact we've got less of that. That's kind of my take off of where we are, absolutely. And, and, and I'll go back to my, my, my comment about, about, uh, you know, uh, our zoo and uh, Oran, the landings there. You know, you, you don't have the, the type of uh, larger landing craft, uh, that you have here in Sicily. You're starting to see the LCI, you're starting to see the LST, but you're seeing them in relatively no, low numbers yeah, yet yeah. compared to what you're going to see uh, in Normandy. The, 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 it's amazing the amount of stuff that the 5th Corps gets ashore in the first 24 hours of D-Day. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's you see that here. When you compare the, the, the ability we had to bring stuff ashore, which, yeah. which is it's less than a year later, effectively. But, yeah. the, but we've kind of reached that that peak. But uh, well, not, it's not a peak, but it's it's, it's reached a, a more comfortable position to be in a year later. Right. Yeah. So, I, um, you know, like I said, th those those attachments, those assets would have been welcome. But because of the availability of landing craft, the problems with mobility on the beach, um, it, it's <laughs> they, they, they yeah. just weren't there. So uh, they could have used them, but they weren't there. A two, two more. Hopefully, we can address these quite quick. Gary Giamari is saying, "Are those first division infantry practices you just mentioned, like integrating the FNGs and Chikumagua, Chik rule the influence of Terry Allen, Teddy Roosevelt, or someone, something else?" We talked about um, um, Truscott over in the third division, how influential he was. Who is the first kind of mover and shaker in the training period for for Sicily? Well, I, I would say both of those the, those those general officers were were in, instrumental in that. Uh, right. Both of those general officers had a, extremely good relationships with the enlisted soldiers because they 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 tried to take care of them. They, you know, they and the soldiers understood that. You know, all the way back from when they were training back at Camp Blanding in Florida before they deployed to uh, North Africa, okay. they you know the, the soldiers uh, had a great deal of respect for both Terry Allen and Rose, uh, Roosevelt. And if you Look at the way they interacted with their soldiers. You know, a lot of that influence is coming from those two, those two okay. officers. Uh, and I think it, I think it bled down to the to the uh, the regimental commanders and down from the, you know there, there's an old saying in the U.S. Army that a 
that a unit takes on the personality of its commander. Yeah. You know? So yeah, yes, yeah. Command, mm-hmm. command has a lot to do with, with how the division does things. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And then one very quick one, then we'll go hand it back to you to take us through this fantastic talk, by the way. So Sean Ben is asking, had they learned to semi deflate tires for beaches before Sicily? That's a good question. I, I I don't think I can answer that because I don't know. That's, uh, that's I have a feeling no. I have a feeling I've read that that was something they integrated, but I may be completely wrong. Someone's bound to know that watching it. Someone's going to be busy scrolling away and find out the answer. But um, folks, as usual, your questions are fantastic. I will let Steve get back on with this. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. But we're learning a lot. And so back to you, Steve. Yeah, I, and I'll address the mobility aspect again here in a little bit uh, uh, and, and, and explain why it becomes important as opposed to it, particularly for tanks is where I'm really going, I'll, I'll, and I'll talk about that here in a moment. Okay, so um, the uh, uh, let's go ahead and, and move. Uh, oh, before, I, before I move from this, I want to point out a few things just for everybody who may not be aware. Uh, maybe this is the first time they're experiencing the First Division, but I just wanted to uh, uh, point out to you very quickly what the First Division's mission was uh, in the initial range, the first you know, two or three days. Uh, as you can see on the, the map there, you'll see the 1st Ranger Battalion and ultimately the 4th Ranger Battalion will come in uh, in the vicinity of Jaila itself and take the town. Uh, the next unit down is the 26th Infantry Division, or uh, Combat Team 26, or the 26th Infantry Regiment. They come ashore at uh, uh, beaches yellow and blue, and their ultimate uh, D plus one objectives uh, is the Ponte Olivo Airfield, which uh, you can see oh, in there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then the combat team 16, uh, they come at, uh, uh, in at Beach Red and Beach Green. And their mission is to initially link up with the 1st uh, Battalion 505th Parachute Infantry at the Piano Lupo uh, Crossroads that you see there kind of center right. You see the parachute there. That's where they're supposed, supposed to land. <laughs> they don't quite. Uh, some land there. Most don't. Uh, and link up with them in the, the, the 505th mission, by the way, is generally speaking to block any movement down that road until the 16th gets up there to, to pitch into the fight. And then ultimately move north to Nisemi in the foothills there to take that town. That's what the 16th Infantry uh, was supposed to. And finally, the 18th Infantry, the 3rd Regiment, was a, the Corps Reserve. Uh, okay, so you kind of know. Uh, and again, if you look at the, the German uh, and Italian units facing them, that's the Livorno Division, which is a motorized division off to the uh, northwest there, and the Hermann Goring Panner, Pan, Hermann Goring Panther Division uh, that's facing uh, uh, the, the rest of the First Division. Yeah, do you want me to give a quick descri- description of the Hermann Goring Panther Division because it is kind yeah, of an cool. all outfit? Yeah, yeah. For, for the benefit of your audience. Uh, the Hermann Goren Pan- Panzer Division. It's a it's a it's a tank division, right? So you think, okay, German Army. Nope, that's an Air Force unit. Okay, and um, and the reason why it's an Air Force unit is because it's named after Hermann Goren, uh, who is of course the you know, commander of the German Air Force. Uh, and the Panzer Grenadier Infantry belonging to the division are actually paratroopers who are also Air Force personnel. So you kind of have, kind of have this oddball outfit uh, working for uh, the the Sixth Italian Army, which is the main headquarters here fighting this uh, the, uh, the defense of Sicily. But having said that, uh, that's not to, to poo poo the Hermann Goring Panzer Division because it's actually a pretty good division, and it's it's in pretty good uh, strength wise, uh, not so much in infantry but armor uh, when they enter this fight. In fact, they have seventeen of the Mark One Tiger tanks which are nothing to sneeze at, of course. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, this gives you a visual image of what a runnel looks like. This particular picture is not in Sicily. Uh, I couldn't find anything that showed uh, any of the runnels in the Sicily area. Uh, They wouldn't have been quite this wide anyway. But as you can see, you've got some almost like creek beds running through the the beach there. And when the... uh, the tide is at low tide. What that does is it forces the landing craft to come in and land at the farthest out uh, sandbar, which is fine. You get out and you walk across and you come to the, the creek bed, if you will, the runnel. And as long as it's, you know, waist deep or something like no big deal. You just wade through it and you, you know, you ultimately get to the beach. But as the tide rises, 
then you start having a significant significant problem because those runnels get deeper. And at some point, the follow-on uh, assault troops are going to hit that runnel and it's going to be over their head in many places, not all places, but in many places. And what that forces them to do is uh, like it happens at uh, Normandy, they pop their May West, but they end up dropping because they, they're carrying so much equipment. They can't continue to carry their weapon or their ammunition or pack and stuff. So they drop it all into the runnel. They get to the beach and they have nothing to fight with. Um, and that does happen at, uh, uh, at Sicily. Um, although it, it, much fewer numbers and much of less of a problem that, than what you're going to see happening at Omaha beach. But it was, it was a challenge. Uh, uh, the, 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 the next thing that I would say also just to carry it through is that once the high tide uh, comes in, they can actually get the landing craft over those sandbars and you start dropping troops directly on the beach. And by the way, just as a, as a, a point of, uh, analysis, when you're looking at the pictures of, uh, the 16th infantry or the 116th infantry going in at Omaha beach, where the water is tells you a lot about what part, what wave we're talking about coming yep. into Omaha beach. For yep. example, if you look at the picture behind Paul there, and thank you for putting that 16th infantry picture. Up it, it stays all the time. It's not just for you, but thank you for, thank you for noticing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can tell that's a picture that was taken later, later in the day, or at least later that morning, I should say, because, you can see that the, the the tide is going almost all the way up to the uh, the shingle at that point. So, okay, uh, move on. Next slide. All right, this is a a picture. By the way, I I, I intended to get you more clearer pictures of these. These are all pulled out of the uh, CMH publication on uh, Sicily and the surrender of Italy, uh, but they work well enough. I think you can see them. You can see the beach there. You can see uh, Jela, the town of Jela, circle in red. And you can see the beach. That's uh, about where the landings uh, take place for the Rangers in the 16th and 26th. You can see how relatively narrow that beach is. It's not really wide. It's uh, it's certainly not as wide as Omaha Beach when they come in at low tide. Um, and then beyond that, of course, you see the Jela Plain. And what you see out there is vegetation. It are not trees. Okay, those are just big bushes at best. So that's a really a very, like I say, a, a very wide open area there. Uh, okay, next slide. All right, another view. This time we're looking, you know, from the east, looking back toward Jela. You can see the landing beaches off to the left there. And you see Coastal Highway number 115 that's tree-lined uh, along there. You can see that's a pretty well-maintained, and that runs off over into the 45th Infantry Division sector. Uh, this picture was taken... Uh, you know, a day or two after probably the 12th or 13th, um, after the, uh, the, the big fight on the 11th of July. But you can see uh, a number of German tanks that are knocked out there on the Jela plane, how open the plane is. This also gives you a pretty good idea how close the Germans yeah. came to getting into, uh, the, you know, the soft, chewy parts of the, uh, uh, of the American defenses. Uh, so again, this, uh, as I mentioned, this this was an opportunity lost for uh, the you know the defenders because they had all kinds of tanks. Um, the 16th Infantry uh, and the 26th Infantry, neither one of them had much in the way of any tank guns. They had a few bazookas, which were the smaller, not the 75 millimeter ones, but smaller ones. They had the they had uh, the 16th. I know had four 57 millimeter anti tank guns, which were fine for the Italian tanks but they weren't going to take out the German tanks. And it's astounding. They ultimately will take out uh, 10 of the, the 17 Tiger tanks that the Hermann Goring uh, division has. And I'm sure some of those had to have been, well, there was a combination of naval gunfire um, and probably largely naval gunfire, but also because the, uh, the cannon company of the 16th Infantry was able to come in ashore over in the 45th Division area march all the way to the uh, the Jela Plain and enter the fight at, at the height of this this attack on the 11th. And they were able to take out uh, uh, quite a few of the uh, the German tanks. Uh, how many of them were Tigers, if any, I don't know. But uh, uh, they ended up getting the presidential unit citation for, for the Rappers. Now, this uh, is, uh, I, I think, uh, this picture actually shows the uh, Highway 115 
uh, that as it's coming going west toward the Piano Lupo crossroads, crossroads. I haven't been able to nail it down for sure, but I think that's what this picture shows. And you can see up ahead there is the Piano Lupo crossroads, which is where much of the fighting in the 16th in Infantry area takes place. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, this is the Piano Lupo uh, crossroads. You see the road, you don't see it very well, but it crosses left to right. That's Highway 115. And the road heading north off into the distance is the road heading off into the Nisemi foothills toward the town of Nisemi itself. And so much of the fighting for the 16th Infantry and the 505th Infantry takes place in the area that you see right there. They get pushed back to the Piano Lupo crossroads on the 11th. But a lot of the fighting takes place north of there and then back to the Piano uh, Lupo crossroads as well. The Germans are able to kind of bypass the Hermann Goring, part of the Hermann Goring Panzer Division, is able to bypass to the west of that. And those are the tanks that you saw that get in close to the uh, close to the beaches there. Okay. Uh, but again, look at the terrain. You see, you know, where the you know, where are the, the trees and so forth. If you have armor available to you. This is not bad armor country, okay? You can you, you can do a lot of bypassing. You're not stuck to the road and so forth. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. I might have to back yep. up. Okay, let me go ahead and address it here. I, I talked about the problems on the beaches. I meant to address this earlier, but here's the gist of the problem that the problems on the beach. The the initial attacks at uh, here at the the uh, Ponte Olivo airfield vicinity, as well as Piano Lupo, uh, took place on the 10th, okay, the day of the landings, essentially. And what that caused um, uh, uh, Bradley to do is to send uh, 10 tanks, actually, he wanted to get more shore, from Combat Command B, 2nd Armored Division, into the beachhead to support the, the 1st Infantry Division. Well, they're only able to get, well, they get 10 tanks ashore, but all 10 tanks of them actually get bogged down in the sand. They can't get them out of the sand. And so you have this, that's the real mobility problem. You got heavy vehicles like that and took them the rest of that night and part of the next morning to dig out the tanks. And even then they only got four of them out and they sent those tanks off uh, to, uh, to assist the division uh, in, in the tank fight. So you're talking about, uh, again, this is where I go back to the lost opportunity, and there's there's probably a little more to the story than I'm relating to you, but you're talking a handful of anti-tank guns, you know, eight maybe, uh, a number of bazookas, uh, all of those capable of taking out Italian tanks and trucks and stuff like that, but not German tanks. You've got the you know, six, uh, six uh, of the cannon company. By the way, the cannon company is, is all mounted on half-tracks, which was unusual. It's not what the TONE called for. But they were on half tracks and they had the mobility to get there and get into the fight. And then whatever those four Sherman tanks did, that's what defeated these two attacks, you know, or at least the attack on the 11th of July. Uh, had, had, had the Germans really pressed their advantage and just got in there and, you know, uh, you know, got to the beaches and started tearing things up. I think uh, you would have had a much different outcome on that. Uh, in the, on the jail you plane. mentioned Cannon Company coming in uh, uh, from elsewhere. So the Great Dominion is asking, why didn't they put anti-tank guns and more artillery up front, knowing that they were landing in some of the best tank, tank country on the island? Well, in fact, the, the, the anti-tank guns I'm talking about indeed were brought in um, uh, early. Uh, one of the things that, that, you know, the story that I, the story I haven't told you is, is that the uh, LCM or LC. I can't remember the type of uh, landing craft, but the landing craft that had the 26th Infantry's anti-tank guns on it was sunk in the harbor. So they had initially none of their guns. The ones that they got probably were for the 18th. When the 18th came ashore, they pushed them forward. I don't know that for a fact, but that's my that's my conjecture. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so uh, Ponte Olivo Airfield, this is, this is the objective. For the 26th Infantry, I talked about Nisimi over on the east side. This is what the 26th Infantry was supposed to take. I believe that if you look where it says Ponte Olivo Airfield, you'll see a road uh, passing to the west of the airfield. I believe that's uh, uh, Highway 117, and I'll explain why that's important here in a little bit. 
Um, but I also want to show you this picture because you're starting to see the um, uh, Jayla Plain ending, and we're starting to go up in elevation into the Nisemi foothills here. So you can clearly see that uh, in, in this picture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide. Uh, to finish up the fight here, uh, it, it, this kind of shows you that you know kind of the major muscle movements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Ranger Battalions, uh, they take the Jayla on the, uh, the very first day, no problem. Nisemi and Ponte Oliva were supposed to be taken on by uh, close of business on the 11th. Um, the 26th was not quite able to get to Ponte Olivo because of the attacks uh, on the 11th. So the 18th is brought in and they end up actually taking the airfield uh, on, the, on the 12th of July. The 16th Infantry uh, is able to continue to move forward from the uh, Piano Lupo uh, crossroads, and they get up and they take the town of Nisemi on the 13th of July, and that kind of finishes the fight here in uh, in the Jayla Plain. Now, from this point forward, we're starting to get, to get up in the foothills. The terrain's going to change again, and as you can see, uh, Combat Team 16 is starting to head off kind of the northeast to uh, Calta Jerome. And the rest of the division is going to follow Highway 117 that I mentioned in the previous slide, yep. which is uh, the, the improved road. So the 16th Infantry kind of has the mission to block, uh, you know, to protect the division's right flank. And the 1st Division is the right flank division of the 7th Army as it heads north. Okay, let's go ahead and move to the next uh, slide. Now, what this shows you is uh, a couple things. One, you see the British 8th Army there. The main effort is uh, they're going to get up over that initial mountain range and drop down into the Catania Plain, uh, where they have very good maneuverability and so forth. The Herman Goring Panzer Division, by the way, slides east there, and that's who uh, who they're going to be fighting uh, pretty much uh, the rest of the fight. And I think you mentioned the the the, uh, uh, the first Canadian Division taking a lot of casualties. I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, Although I may be wrong here, they, they end up uh, taking on the Herman Gorm Pander Division quite a bit during this uh, march up country here. The seventh uh, U.S. Seventh Army is uh, they're moving due north and to the northwest. They're going to head out to the Third Infantry Division uh, along with the 45th. The 45th makes a pretty amazing uh, and disciplined uh, movement behind the First Division uh, to get behind it to link up with the third ID, and they're the two divisions that start moving off to the northwest to clean up that part of uh, Sicily. Um, and as you might imagine, uh, a lot of the German units that are out there are going to start gradually shifting toward the east because they want to get out of Messina too. Okay, so the first division, if you look at the, the, the arrows that I've drawn there, uh, you got the 16th Infantry going from the semi they end up going into Calta Jerome, taking that town, um, and the rest of the division is pushing up Highway 117 toward a town called Piazza Amarina. Uh, well, it's about this time that the uh, 15th Army Group changes the boundary, and they push the 8th Army boundary west so that the 1st Canadian Division can have Highway 117. And so the 1st Division has to start moving west to get out of the Canadians area. And they do that, generally speaking, in the vicinity of Piazza and Marina, and they get west of that uh, uh, that line. Well, if you look at the the terrain at that point, you can kind of see that there ain't a whole a lot of roads out there. And, what, and there are roads more out there where the 1st Division is going to be moving through, but they're basically mostly dirt roads and goat trails, okay? There's not a there's not a high speed avenue of approach out uh, out in that part. So they're they're pushing along uh, over the high ground uh, with uh, pretty poor roads. Um, and I'll talk more about this boundary here. Uh, well, let me go ahead and talk about it, uh, right now uh, and get that out of the way. Uh, as they continue to move north north, what happens is uh, the Eighth Army decides. You know, uh, the the First Canadians are supposed to take uh, the town of Inna. Inna, by the way, was the headquarters of the German uh, correction, the uh, Italian Sixth Army, as I mentioned earlier, and they were the guys assigned to take that town. Well, for various and sundry reasons, uh, the British Eighth Army pulls them back toward the east, and it starts to create this gap between the First Infantry Division 
and the 1st Canadian Army. And so what happens is uh, the 1st Infantry Division is given the mission to take Inna. Uh, so my regiment, 16th Infantry, gets the call, and they move on Inna. They take the town against relatively little. Uh, there was no big major battle there, but there, there was a little bit of resistance, but really from a rear guard, no, no big fight. Um, and that night, <laughs> the BBC announces that the Canadians took in a, <laughs> which didn't do much for, you know, uh, you know, allied cooperation, I guess, in, in Sicily, but uh, um, the big red one guys kind of took it to heart. Anyway, uh, so they continue to move north out of Inna. And at this point, basically due north out of Inna, the, the, the boundary between the 8th Army and the 7th uh, uh, Army is, is supposed to go basically due north all the way to the coast. And uh, as the 1st Division uh, starts to, to move north, by the way, they're now facing the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division, uh, commanded by a guy named uh, Everhard Rote. And it's it's a pretty good division too. Uh, it's uh, it's in pretty good uh, in terms of its strength and uh, combat capabilities. It's a it's, it's a it's a good outfit. So they're pushing against the the 15th Panzer Grenadiers, and as they get up in the vicinity of that town that you see there called Sperlingua, uh, what it determines, and then we're talking you know what about about a week later, uh, it's determined that okay maybe the Eighth Army isn't going to be able to. Uh, take Messina by itself. Maybe it does need some help in the Seventh Army, and so the boundary changes, as you can see there. It goes kind of north, uh, east toward uh, Messina. And uh, at that point, the First Infantry Division uh, boundary changes, and they move uh, on the 28th of July. They take the towns of uh, Sperlingua and Nicosia, and that starts to set up the. Uh, and, and by the way, the. The, the the fighting in through here is, is not it's it's sporadic uh, some of it is sharp but it's not really that heavy okay it's not like they're they're fighting for every you know peak uh, that they're that they're which they're, is exactly what the first Canadian division are doing at this at this same moment with the boundary shift and I was just saying in the sidebar yeah. how your your interpretation of the boundary shift, it's, it's not. It's not. It's just slightly different to Mark Zelke's from the Canadian point of view. It's not that either of you, one of you, is right or wrong. It's just yeah. you know, the, from the Canadian point of view, they suddenly get a, a, a tougher nut to crack. And then from it's just it's fascinating, as you said at the beginning, you've got a clear, um, you know, bias. You've got your first division cap on there. But it's interesting that that these yeah. interpretations. That's what we love about this channel is that you get <laughs> the same story from slightly different points of view, which True. is fantastic. Yeah. Well, I would say from the first division perspective, the biggest concern, of course, was that opening that gap. Yeah, you want to try to maintain, you know, contact with the guys in your left and right and so forth, and 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 that's what that whole movement toward and and it was it was intended to do. That 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 arrow you see on the British Eighth Army is probably, in fact, I would say it's not probably. It is too a little too far east. The, the Canadians aren't that far uh, from uh, you know you know we don't have a whatever it is about a fifteen you know, mile gap between yep. the first division and the, I, at least I don't think it ever got that big. I'm pretty sure it did. Okay. Uh, so uh, they, they're starting to shift into, uh, uh, in, into the, the real uh, higher mountains. So before I get into that discussion and the battle of Turin, I wanted to take you through and show you some more terrain pictures to give you a feel for uh, what this movement looks like from the vicinity of Calta Jerome and on up to the to close to Tarun. If I can go back one slide real quick, I want to point out, uh, yep. if you'll see uh, the lower, uh, the west side of the map, you'll see a town called Caltenesetta. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, that's the first place we're going to go. And you can see it's kind of out of the first division sector, probably, maybe it might be, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, although there's nothing major that goes there, but let's go ahead and go to the picture picture now. And the why I wanted you to see this is because now you can see the town itself and you see that this is still in the foothills. And you, and you can see it's built on what is essentially a, a somewhat of a plateau there, but not too far in the distance. You're starting to see the mountains of, uh, uh, of Sicily. And it's at this point when you get up there, things like uh, the mobility for, your, for any armor assets that you have start to decrease rapidly, okay? And it starts becoming a mountain 
infantry fight, uh, and which is what this is going to end up being, uh, as you'll see. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, what it shows is the town of Inna itself, kind of. It's up on the high ground that you see there in the background. Uh, this is a view from Inna from the south. Uh, you see the, the the row, the double row of trees. That is uh, Highway 117 that I mentioned earlier. That's the main drag, the main, main route up through there. Again, up here, it's dirt road, but still not um, pretty well maintained. Uh, the other thing I would point out to you is that Looking at, I, I don't know what it looks like to go into Inna from the east side, uh, and that may be one of the rationale reasons, uh, you know, reasons for for going, uh, having the Canadians take it in the first place. I don't know, but thank goodness <laughs> that the Germans didn't defend it very well, that they actually evacuated because that would have been a very tough fight, as you can see, yeah. making your way up that high ground and trying to get into the town. Okay, the next slide uh, shows you from the inner perspective back toward the south. And once again, you can see the foothills out there. You can see how open it is, and you still have some pretty good maneuverability, or you're not necessarily stuck to the roads uh, up in this area. And there might be a few areas where if you're moving tanks through, you got to get a, an engineer unit to kind of fill in a creek bed or something like that. But uh, by and large, it's still get, you got some fairly decent maneuverability uh, coming up into the end of uh, vicinity and not too far north of there. Uh, so, okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, this is a picture of Highway 117. It's actually north of Sperlingua uh, in Nicosia. So it's, it's out of the first division area. But what it shows you, and what you see is a destroyed bridge there on the highway. Uh, but what it shows you is the highway. You see kind of a wide spot there where you can get, you know, at least you know, two lane traffic through, maybe three uh, vehicles through, which was not unusual uh, around bridge sites in like road junctions and stuff like that. But as you get down on the windy roads on the mountains and stuff, very frequently you get down to yeah, one I've lane. I've experienced that myself. You kind of get the passing areas just before and the other sides of bridges. Uh, and and yet you get 100 yards beyond and suddenly it's down to, to, to one way only. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it, it it's important. As we said at the beginning of visiting these sites. I haven't I haven't been to specifically the first divisions there in Sicily, but it, it it's pretty much the same across across the country. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you is that still? I guess you're talking about recent experience. That's still true today, then, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I was there five years ago, four years ago, something like that. Yeah. yeah. They have more paved roads than they used to. Uh, yeah, they are, but they'll be, but they're paved, but it doesn't make them wider because you you get these kind of rocky outcrops, and indeed Italian pillboxing, so that you know you get a little wide bit, and then it just you get a choke point, you know, half a mile down the road, then you go on again. There's another choke point, and it's lots of stop start. So, um, I, I, I as I was driving through, or actually Mag was driving, and we were thinking I wouldn't want to bring a convoy up here because you'd 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 be forever stopping and starting. Okay, well, yeah, let's go ahead and move on to the the, the next slide. Uh, very very quickly, this is in the town of uh, Sarami. I'll show you where that is here. It's near uh, Troina. But again, as I talked about these villages being built in medieval periods, you know, here you are. You're trying to get a half track through a really narrow street here. And in some cases, they actually had to bulldoze a route around some of these little villages to get the tanks by because you couldn't get the tanks through there. Uh, so, uh, again, a very good visual image of some of the difficulties of the... Uh, the, uh, the terrain uh, imposed on uh, the first division. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, again, as we start getting up into these windy roads, narrow roads and so forth, uh, you find that you have to start getting the infantry up into the high ground. They're actually doing it before this, but they're walking the ridges. And all that's up there, if there's anything, are these little goat trails like you see this here. This particular picture is probably a third ID unit. I don't think I don't. I never went across anywhere they where they said they had any mules with the first division. Uh, but the the point is the trail, uh, and to kind of give you a visual concept of you know the over uh, over hill over dale, that's kind of what you're walking over uh, to kind of protect the uh, the resupply columns and stuff down below. Uh, the only other point I'd say is the the vegetation that you see there. Yeah, typical. I mean, small trees, bushes. That's about all you're going to get. Yeah, okay. I, I made that point myself, Steve, when I was there, because you know I, I live in I live in the Bocage, so I live where visibility is is never really possible, and yet in Sicily, 
you get the olive trees where the it goes, goes skinny branches, then the, then the foliage kind of the olives start further up. So you can actually see underneath the kind of the head of the trees. Then you get yeah. these low kind of scrub stuff. And I was amazed by the fact that even though you know you're driving you're driving and looking at a map saying that these fields left and right are full of vegetation and you actually get there none of it really you would call cover so to speak it's sort of it's kind of a paradoxically open and covered at the same time it's sort of unique yeah. to that kind of part of the world i think yeah well of course it, you know if if you're infantry you can use it but if you're riding around an m4 sherman eh, probably not so hot <laughs> you know? okay um so let's move on to Troina here and uh, I just wanted to show you the terrain around Tarawina. Uh, you can see the really high ground to the north there. Uh, if you look at the road that runs through that, that's Highway 120. Uh, you can look at it and see how, you know, you're up in the mountains now. It's, you know, twisty, windy uh, roads, very difficult to maneuver on. You can't get off into a whole lot in a lot of places. And uh, except for maybe down in that valley area, you might be able to do a little bit there. But even with the, the, the streams and stuff, you know, washing down to the mainstream. It, it, you know, you're, you're pretty much roadbound. Um, and, and as a result of that, and, and by the way, Sarami, that's the little town there at the back end of the arrow. That's the town that had the picture with the half track in it. That's where that was. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the main average approach into Troina is from Sarami down Highway 120. If you're going to uh, attack, particularly if you're going to try to use armor and make it a quick attack and everything, that's where it's going to take place. And the Germans, as you well know, very good at defense. Uh, so they set up their defensive line, as you see there, the red lines, um, and taking advantage of the high ground where they can. Uh, and mostly, you know, to the north, they were down in the low ground in the center. But that's because they want to form that pocket that you see there. You see the pocket uh, where the arrow is going into? That's a kill sack. That's a kill zone that they wanted to use. And so that's how they set this up. Because they figured the main push is going to come right down through there. And guess what? That's exactly what happens the first time. And so um, you can uh, see if I've missed anything I want to talk about. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, the Troina itself. If you look at Troina, the town there, kind of center mass, uh, it sits on a little knoll, a little piece of high ground. And uh, so it's up above the terrain around it. Again, built for defense, built in the medieval period and so forth. So the roads coming into it are a little windy, you know, uh, you know you, you're not going to charge straight into Torino with a with an armor attack unless you don't have any, any armor defense. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And this kind of shows you what the Germans were trying to achieve, and they did it very well. Uh, any armored or mechanized drive down the road is going to be stopped by heavy firepower uh, from the high ground onto the road. And what that does is it forces, if you're going to come down with infantry, it forces them uh, to come, come up on that high ground that you see just north of the road. Yep. That's called the Troina Ridge. And probably they're going to advance on the south side of that below the military crest of the hill to prevent fires coming on them from the north side, at least. But as you can see from the south side, no problem. They can re reach out and touch it. And they can certainly put artillery fire on you. Uh, so... Uh, and I said their, their, their main defensive positions are on the, the, the various and sundry high ground that you see uh, there. You see, you see uh, uh, the Mount Pellegrino in the south, yeah. Mount uh, Blanco, uh, Hill 1034, uh, and then up in the, the, to the north of there. Um, that's, that's, and of course, Troina, Troina itself uh, to some degree. Uh, that's where their defenses are. So you're going to have to attack uphill to get to them if you want to. Okay, so that's the defense. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, it's not, you can't see it very well. You're kind of up on the Troina Ridge looking down in the valley. You see Troina kind of on that little knoll down there. And then, the, of course, the high ground behind it. Uh, you'll see uh, Mount Etna, and the big white mound at the back. That's, uh, that's Mount yeah. Etna out there. Better picture is the next one. Okay, this is taken from Torina, and you can see Sarami off in the distance in the upper left there. The, the uh, Highway 120 comes out of Sarami to the right through uh, south of the Torina Ridge, and you can see how the Torina Ridge curves down toward Torina, and then you'll see where it picks up against this Highway 120, comes down uh, and 
uh, into Torina from the very front that you see there. Very good road. And that's how where it comes into Torina itself. Um, and then when you look at Torina, Torina uh, as a city, you can tell this one's going to be a little bit easier to get through because if you look off to the right, you see a relatively wide road, and that's 120 coming through there. So getting tanks through there and all your supplies and stuff, not a problem. You'll see another one that's not quite as wide just on the left-hand side of town, but trying to come through the middle of town, it's going to be, you know, so those two routes are going to be the routes that they're going to come through to to get into to to get into and beyond Rowena itself. Okay, um, next slide. What this shows is the fourth Tabor of Goons. <laughs> it is a, a Moroccan infantry unit, it's about a battalion sized organization that were here attached to the, uh, the the first division for a period of time. They're uh, on uh, probably the next ridge over from the uh, uh, Troina Ridge. But again, it, it shows how they're moving. It shows how they're, you can see some, uh, what are essentially, you know, uh, an advanced picket uh, out toward the front there, you know, your your scouts, if you will, uh, toward the front along the ridge line. Uh, but everybody else is moving down below the military crest of the hill to prevent observation, at least from the other side. And they're obviously moving off to a terrain, which would be off to the right of the picture. Um, but again, very open terrain. There's not a whole lot, uh, a lot out there for uh, you know, people to hide, hide behind. Therefore, usually most of these movements are actually being conducted at night, not during the day, for obvious reasons. Which, well, by the way, is another thing the First Division is noted for, is they do a lot of night fighting in World War II. Okay, next slide. Brilliant stuff. Okay, to kind of uh, kind of finish up the story here, uh, what this shows is the final plan for the, the attack on Proina. Just very briefly, if you look kind of the center, uh, you'll see what's the 39th Infantry Regiment on the Troina Ridge. That's the original attack that takes place. They end up maintaining that location all the way through the fight. Uh, and they will fight and they will come down that ridge line during the final final attack as well. Um, that attack that takes place by the 30 on the I think the 31st of July, and it's you know clearly defeated pretty easily. Then there's a series of attacks and counterattacks that kind of go nowhere. And finally, uh, uh, the the first division gets all their forces forward, all three regiments, and they launch an attack on the 5th of August. Uh, you can see the fourth gooms. Uh, attack over to that, uh, and that's where I think that picture is taken. That over the ne ne next uh, ridge line from the uh, Torina Ridge, 26 actually makes it down to Mount Basilio. You see it circled there, and uh, they're able to put direct fires on Highway 120. That's kind of the key point, I think, where General Rote said it's probably time for us to start getting to move out because they're going to cut by line of communications here. Um, 18th is end up, ends up taking Mount Pellegrino, which gave them great fields of fire, a correction to observations of fire uh, on uh, the uh, Mount San Grigio as well as Troina. And the 16th Infantry is able to take the uh, uh, Hill 1034. And from there, they're able to advance that night into Troina the following morning and, and capture the town. Um, now, like Inna and others, by this time, the Germans have said, "Okay, we got these rear, rear detach, rear, uh, rear, you know, rear detachments to kind of fight the fight while the rest of the division gets out, the heck out of here." And they do a very efficient job of getting the entire 15th Panzer Grenadier Division out of this trap and on its way to the next phase of the Mount Etna, Mount Etna line. And that pretty much finishes up the fight uh, for uh, the first division. Uh, they're done on the sixth. Uh, they've captured Troina. They go into an assembly area in the ninth, and as most of your folks are aware, on the I think it's the eleventh that uh, General Hubner uh, ends up taking command of the first division, and uh, Terry Allen and and uh, General Roosevelt are moved out quietly to go into uh, rest and re uh, rehab, and they end up going into the fight again later on in in, uh, in France. Uh, and let's see, what's the next slide? Uh, yeah, just some pictures of the 16th Infantry moving into uh, Troina itself. That uh, upper right picture, you see the buildings there. I think that's that main drag I pointed out. I think that yeah, wide uh, like avenue. Yeah. I think that's where they're coming in at right there. Uh, but I just and I think that road that you see there at the bottom is probably the same route as well. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the next slide. Is your, is your uh, close slide. Uh, again, 16th Infantry guys coming through uh, Trowina, obviously further into town. Uh, what questions uh, uh, can I entertain at this point? Well, we'll do some questions from the viewers. My first one is, is so so when you're doing this as a staff ride, either online, you know, what what are the takeaways? What are the what are the lessons that should have been should be learned today? What should the 16th and the first division have done better? What were the what were the strengths? What were the weaknesses? What are the what are the what are the pub conversations at the end of a staff ride about about Sicily? Well, first off, let me let me share with uh, show you the. <laughs> to my knowledge, uh, we have never done a staff ride for uh, Sicily. Right. Uh, we would love to do a staff ride for Sicily. the The challenge that we face is that um, the United States Army Europe has their own staff ride team, and uh, they they tend not to like us encroaching on their territory. Right. Uh, for obviously reasons, they, they you know they they've got their own uh, guys that are available. It would be cheaper for units over there to use those guys than us anyway, because they have to bring us from overseas and so forth. Uh, having said that, we do do a number of overseas staff rides that are kind of unusual. Um, we <laughs> we've actually built, for example, an at two staff ride in the in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, we were going to do that for the first corps, but it got canceled unfortunately. But we are now in the process of building a virtual staff ride which I haven't really talked about much, uh, uh, if any. Uh, we do virtual staff rides, and I'll give you a good example of one. Y you know, if you go to Stalingrad today, Stalingrad didn't look very much like it did in 1942. So what we've done is we've rebuilt the city virtually, and uh, <clears throat> we have uh, built essentially a Stalingrad campaign staff ride that takes you from Operation Barbarossa all the way through the end of Operation Uranus with the uh, Soviet counterattack, but the vast majority of the staff raid takes place with installing red itself. And uh, <clears throat> so th that kind of gives you an idea of some of the capabilities have. We also do much smaller virtual staff rides. I'll give you an example there. Uh, we do something called uh, the twin tunnels, which is really kind of a, a component of, uh, of our chip young knee staff ride series. It's in a battle that takes, it's a company sized battle that takes place prior to the Battle of Chip Yomni in Korea in 1951. And we've rebuilt the train around the train, twin tunnels and we take you through that whole fight up and down the, the Korean you know, countryside and so forth. Uh, and, and, and it's built, the, the terrain is built using two things. One, it's built using uh, what's called TEDS or TIDS, I guess it is. It's a, it's a terrain data a database uh, that they take things like um, uh, like uh, uh, Google Earth imagery or satellite imagery, and they drape it over uh, the the elevation. So, and then our, our texts come in, and they re they you know they they erase and recolor and do whatever, all the things they need to do to recreate the terrain as it was in 1951, 1942, or whatever. Um, one of the best ones that we have in that regard is we have a series of six a Normandy campaign staff rides. They're all virtual terrain. And, uh, you know, it's got Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, uh, the airborne operation. Um, we do a logistics uh, staff ride because we're starting to try and pull logistics guys in to get them to think about all this stuff as well. And uh, they, uh, the guy, our tech, rebuilt Omaha Beach, and he used it using bigot maps and uh, aerial photographs and so forth. So it looks like Omaha wow. Beach in 1944, you know, complete with you know, all the German uh, positions. We can take you into, uh, for example, the, you know where the uh, National Guard Monument is there at Burville Draw that had the 88 in it. That's all been rebuilt as part of what was called the Casino Hotel. And we can take you into that and show you what the German gunners saw and so forth. So, um, so, the long-winded explanation is what a virtual staff ride is, and it works exactly the same way as a ground staff ride. Uh, as far as uh, what are my thoughts are on Sicily, uh, I would say that, you know, there's probably the the, the biggest thing uh, is, is really kind of a logistics thing. And you, you've heard the old saying that, you know, uh, amateur study tactics and professional study logistics. We love that one here, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you know, as one of your, your – your uh, audience brought up um, how well did they really think out what gets brought ashore? 
okay, and when it gets brought ashore. Uh, and that's a logist logistician's job. They do the loading yeah. of everything. Oh, and it's a planner's job, too. Don't get me wrong. And the planner plays a, very, a major role at it, too. But, but uh, you know, um, I, I think that that plus the – how do you miss the fact that the beaches were so soft and you weren't going to be able to get tanks across it, especially yeah. going well, – We, we did a show about that. that about the combined operations pilotage parties last week and, and some of the beaches were surveyed, but it was still a system that was developing. It hadn't like, like, you know, the, th the theme is nothing by Husky is the, is the finished product yet by 1944. Sure. It's maybe not the finished product, but it's much closer to being the finished product. So, so beach, I mean, but it, then when we did our torch series back in, uh, whenever that was, you know, and the fact the third ID came ashore near Casablanca didn't even know there were kind of reefs and things there. You know, you can see the progression already. They haven't there. They made some fundamental errors in misjudging thing here. They're making some some lesser errors. And then by normally they're still making errors, but less again. Exactly. And you can see that progression. You know, it, it, it is, you know, uh, but you know, we will bring things in. But, but I want to have the one question I want to ask you. Which I knew we'd talk about because we talked about it um, before we went live. Is is the the Germans and their their response? Because when you go when you when you uh, you know you're talking you're doing these these educational staff right things, you know there's the there's what the Allies are doing, there's what the Germans are doing. Because as you went took us through, the, the German Tigers and the armored vehicles that end up pushing across the plains towards the beach get knocked out pretty damn quickly, really, by a combination of Navy and the Cannon Company and blah blah blah. But but what should the Germans have done? Because it came up last week, because if they, obviously the Germans don't want a beachhead to be established. It makes sense to try and stop the landing force getting the, 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 the second waves and third waves and supplies ashore and let them fail, you know, stop them getting a beachhead. But at the same time, as you said, they've got this, these wonderful foothills a couple of miles back that would be better possibly to stay. So what the Germans and their counterattack, what, what would you have done? Well, I, I, again, I, you know, a, a, a an armored division uh, is not a defensive weapon. Yep, okay, true. when you start telling armored guys, "Hey, you got to go in the defense," they're not happy campers. You know, they that's true. Hey, yep. we're an offensive arm. We want it. We we want to bust through and get in that in that deep chewy uh, uh, rear of the enemy. Um, and that's exactly what these guys and on the Jailer plane were attempting to do, or should be doing, is getting into you know, when you start tearing up those beaches and you're blowing up logistics piles and you're just, you know, uh, taking out uh, landing craft and all, all that kind of stuff, you, you've you've created a, quite a problem. It doesn't mean you can't continue the fight. Uh, I'm talking about the, on the American side, uh, but you've you've put a real damper in in how long this whole operation is going to take. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I, I I again not having done a an in-depth study of the, you know, the the Italian Sixth Army and their command climate and and the Livorno Division how they were organized and how uh, you know uh, what's his name Con uh, Conrath you know got along with this you know the senior uh, uh, corps commander the next corps you know, corps commander and how well the the Livorno Division which is a motorized division yeah, true. and the and the Herman Gorman Pan Panther Division uh, we're supposed to coordinate their attack and everything. I, it doesn't, it, just looking at what happens, it doesn't appear to me that they did a very good job at trying to, I mean, the, the concept is good because if, if you look at it, you got, they got the Hermit Goring Panzer Division, the Livorno Division kind of all moving toward uh, the Jela and the beaches of Jela, uh, which conceptually looks good, but I'm not sure how well they were, they're recording, uh, uh, coordinating with each other. Uh, and, 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 you know, whether they really understand each other's real objectives so that they can support the other guy understanding what he's supposed to, yeah. you know, what he's supposed to be doing. Well, that, that was a recurring theme in the show we did with Julio last week about the challenge is that, you know, the, 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 the line, the two lines are going in opposite directions, allied cooperation, combined arms, ability for the British, American Canadians, et cetera, to work alongside each other. It's, it's, it's on its way up. Torch was a low yeah. spot. It's on its way up. The German and Italians, it's on, it's on a, it's on a massive tail dive, you know? So, so, the, the 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 axis have forces that are capable of doing more than they did, but they need that control. They need that command and control. They need to be singing to the same hymn sheet with a with a, a clear idea of what they're doing. And and luckily, 
it, it didn't happen. And, and you know, I think like with Torch, the Allies got away with things in Husky that they don't need to get away with later on in the war because they've covered their bases more. I mean, you know, you, when, when people like, well, we're going to bring you back to talk about Omaha in the future, I'm sure. But with, with, with D-Day and Omaha, if you look at the tables, at the landing tables in Omaha Beach, you Americans are bringing some things ashore pretty early that you don't really need first day. But you've got that luxury. You can start thinking about having, well, we'll have a few of them. We've got space for them. We'll have a few of them. Why don't we bring these guys ashore? That isn't well, a possible in 43, is it? And as you're, I'm sure, very, very well aware is that as the landings are going on that morning and things aren't going too well, General Wyman, who's now this first ID assistant division commander, says, no more junk ashore, bring infantry. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. they start pushing the infantry forward and, and keeping, you know, you know, we can we get the tanks ashore, we can get the artillery ashore later, get the infantry forward. That's what we need right now. And that's, you know, that's, again, uh, that's leadership in action right there, you know. Uh, and yeah. sometimes I think we tend to, uh, Omaha happens because of the individual, the initiative of the individual soldier and small unit leaders. But Absolutely. you have a number of key decisions made by senior commanders that do affect the outcome of the fight. And that's one of them. And we will do that later on another show. So we will bring things to an end. So, folks, it's been a fantastic uh, uh, Operation Husky uh, couple of weeks, and we will be turning to the subject in the future. Steve, I extend formally invitation to come back and talk about Omaha at whatever level of depth you want to do. We can, I can go and get yeah. some video of some of the base because I'm only 15 minutes away. That would be fantastic. Um, yeah, um, it's been great talking to you. Folks, I'm back again tomorrow. Arthur is coming on from Canada to talk about the Battle of Tilly Lac, or the battles, the five battles of Tilly Lac Campania, which is a small village just south of Caen that you kind of blink and you miss it. You drive through it in a matter of seconds. And yet there are five battles, July 25th, July 31st, August 1st, August 5th, and August 8th. And you hear about all those battles tomorrow with Arthur, with his fantastic PowerPoint and video I took last week. So you can do that. I'm looking forward to that one. And so, folks, um, thank you for your attention. Steve, thanks for answering all the questions. Thanks for the presentation. Can't wait to invite you back. back. Folks, I'll see you all again tomorrow. It's Paul Weather for World War II TV saying see you next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye.